Thanks for listening to the AZ Wildcats post game. This is brought to you by Four Peaks, presenting partner Four Peaks uh, with Ben White, John Brogan. I am Mike Luke. John Brogan filling in. Really good friend of mine. Knows a lot about sports. You might remember him from being on 1290. Our guy, insider, John Brogan. All right, guys. Arizona wins 35 to 18. Ben, this was an absolute ass whooping. That's the best way that I can put it. A top, top to bottom. This was uh, offense, defense, you name it. Arizona, Arizona demoralized a really good Utah team. To say it mildly, and it's it's not the fact that Arizona won. It's it's how the win occurred today. I mean, from the get go, we saw it early on with just the team being so active and going up. You know, twenty eight nothing. I mean, you saw it from the get go with that block punt that led to a score and just from a momentum standpoint Arizona just looked like the better team out there I think they were dominating early on but on both sides of the line of scrimmage Utah was without four key guys on defense not sure how much that made an impact but by and large the defensive line was getting pressure all game Utah's offense was flustered they couldn't really do anything and Arizona just had it easy in the sense that they were so dominant and the game was in their hands the entire time, Mike. All they had to do was be smart and efficient with the ball. I mean, you saw Noah Fafita have a spectacular game, but at the same time, it's not like he was throwing Hail Mary passes down the sideline every single play. These were five to six yard passes in space with receivers and running backs just making plays. And this was a domination on all three phases of the ball. Brogan, thoughts? Yeah, I think when you think back to the beginning of the season, you looked at Arizona's schedule and you're like, okay, six, seven wins is probably realistic. But when you looked at the schedule, you're like, Washington lost, Utah lost, because it's not very often we can actually compete with Utah, much less beat Utah. Right. But to Ben's point, they set the tone early, converted the big third down on the first drive, scored a touchdown, blocked the punt, scored another touchdown, got a stop. And then you're like, hmm, okay, this is going to get ugly quick. And then the rain came and it slowed the game down. But again, I think this is the difference you see with Fafita versus Delora is Fafita can just keep the game clean. He's not giving the other team any additional, you know, kind of possessions, putting the offense in a bad spot. And so it's hard once Arizona gets ahead, it's hard to come back because they don't turn the ball over and they can keep the chains moving. All right. Sorry. Uh, got the comments coming in here. Pa- Sorry, Patrick Stark. We got excited. Uh, you guys started too early. You didn't miss anything, right? To, uh, you didn't miss anything. Okay. What we well, Let's talk about the defense here first. Um, Brogan, you made a really good point right here. 89 plays that Utah ran, and it did feel like they did absolutely anything out there. It, this was a Arizona was in Utah the entire game. There was no explosive plays. And that's something you generally don't see. If you see somebody put 89, uh, put 89 plays up, or you're probably going to see a little bit more than 18 points, especially when two of them or 14 of them are in garbage time. Yeah. And if I tell you before the game starts, hey, this game, Utah is going to run 90 plays, Arizona's going to run 60, then you just assume that Utah's running the ball, moving the chains, and just marching up and down the field. And Arizona's got three and outs, things of that nature. But Arizona showed how explosive their offense is. They had. Four or five big plays in the first half. Utah had the ball a lot, but right. couldn't turn it in any points. And so they were forced early to go for it on fourth downs. They probably wouldn't have. And so um, I'm still – I'm not in shock per se because this team has been really, really good in, in the last like four or five weeks. Even Washington, USC, they were good. But it's still a little shocking that we beat Utah so handily even though we scored again, even though we started the show before the game was over. But Yeah, Ben, it felt to me, I know, right? Exactly. That's when you know you're good. When you put in your backup quarterback and he throws, by the way, Jed Fish will absolutely lead with that in the postgame about Jaden Delora uh, really picking the slack up when he came in there. Hey, but do, do you think people are going to think that Jaden Delora is going to start next week because of this last possession? Well, I don't know. We'll just see what we'll just see what Jed Fish has to say, my friend. I don't know. I just trust the coach. Um, but uh, also, you knew, to me, this game really, you knew that Utah was in deep, uh, deep poo when Arizona marches right down the field and gets that touchdown. And then the uh, the blocked punt for a touchdown. Ben, that to me was the play of the game right there. I don't think that Air- Utah was ever able to come back from that one. And honestly, I don't know that they would have ever because it just felt like Arizona was better across the board. 
Hundred percent, and I mean that set the tone early because it was fourteen nothing, and Utah has had quarterback issues all year. Rising hasn't been healthy. Their offense is is heavily predicated on the run game, and I know when you look at the box score, you may say, "Oh, well, they rushed for more yards than Arizona," but by and large, in that first half, and especially through at least the first half of the third quarter, they did struggle to run the ball fluidly, and Arizona was able to shut that down. I thought Nansen was really aggressive, just with the pressure, right? Bringing guys up and at the same time being calculated with it. It wasn't all out pass rush every single play, but they did enough to make Utah very uncomfortable. And I think that's what we thought coming into this game, right? Is our biggest concern was how is Arizona going to adjust to that tempo and what they bring at the line of scrimmage? And they just made Utah uncomfortable. They punched them right in the mouth. And as a result, I mean, offensively, they could never get anything going. And let's be honest here. This is a team, regardless if they're healthy or not on the offensive side they've never been really built to play from behind and when Arizona was able to build that lead and and get up as far as they were they were just in total control of the game and Arizona was able to score quickly it's not like Arizona was you know in the first half especially from a play standpoint just burning the clock time after time they were able to get two three four plays out and drive the ball down the field and get in the red zone and and be efficient so I thought that offensively that set the tone early on and I think the weather definitely had something to do with it to Brogan's point but it, when you're able to go up so quickly and just in the way that they did, it makes it really hard. And you got to give credit to the coaching staff because that is the one area of attack. And I think that's the one area that won them this game. It's just that hot start. Yeah, it was a hot start. But Brogan, when you can get ahead like Arizona did, and then you can play downhill from there, from lack of a better term, this defense, especially on the right side of the Utah offensive line, basically you could tell that they felt that there was something there that they could attack. And whenever Utah dropped back, they were always – the quarterback was generally running for his life. There was, and when he did have time, there was nobody open. It was really a masterful performance by Nansen's group. And there's a lot of talent there, which we'll get to as well. Yeah. I mean, we've come a long way from Parker Zellers at nose tackle <laughs> and we now have Bill Norton and, and really eight or nine guys on the D line that have the ability to kind of make impact plays. I think the biggest difference for Arizona, we've had good quarterbacks in the past. We've had tons of good skill players, but I don't remember a time where we were as physical on the offensive and defensive line as your Utah's, as your Washington's, right. as your USC's. And so now what you're seeing is we're able to match them on the offensive defensive line. And now our skill players are up to par or in a lot of ways better. And we're just kind of beating everybody now at this point. And so a little bit of luck, Oregon loses and we get a chance at Washington to get in the title game. I'm not so sure I'm picking against Arizona in that game the way we played the first time. Here's what we need to have happen. And by the way, um, if you uh yeah, we still have a few tickets left for the PHNX takeover in the Valley, Arizona ASU next week. Jacob Franklin, if you could pull that one up, that would be uh, awesome. Check this out again. Go to go PHNX. Great stuff. Again, we'd love to see you up there. Uh, let's show everybody what Arizona is all about. The official PHNX takeover, best in the city, Saturday, November 25th. Again, go to go PHNX and check that one out. Um, what also really, I think, really struck me, and Brogan made this point, Ben, is this team across the board really takes a backseat to very few teams when it comes to overall talent. Now, again, it's not Georgia. I get that. But there are NFL players at pretty much every level of this team. And if they're not NFL players, they're all conference players, whether it's your quarterbacks, whether it's your running back, wide receiver, D-line, linebacker. I can keep going. DBs. This team checks off boxes. There's nothing fluky about that. And that's where I think this is unique and something that we, you know, when Rich Rod had the uh, the Fiesta Bowl team, it still felt, all right, well, Rich Rod's out scheming. Um, you got some lucky breaks. This team just beats the snot out of you. This team has a foundation under Fish, and that's something that we haven't seen here in a, a very, very long time. Um Tons of talent, like you said. I think we talked about it last week on the post game show. Whereas, if you compared the rosters up and down on both sides of the ball with Anthony Jamino, you probably got at least 12 to 13, 14, if not 15 guys 
who you wouldn't be surprised, you know, play in the NFL or at least sniff a practice squad or get a tryout. There's just talent up and up and down the board. But I think for them, the the big key, and you saw this last year, just how bad they were defensively, how much of an issue pass rush and just getting constant pressure on the opponent was for them. Right. I think the key is that defensive line. I mean, you bring in Upshaw, you bring in Norton, and the young guys you have too, from a developmental standpoint, have I think come a longer way than you maybe initially thought. So so in a weird way, it's it's funny to say at this point, uh, you know, you still can't believe it. But Arizona has been able to rotate guys on the defensive side and, and not because of injuries or because of bad play, because we have so many guys who can get in there and contribute in different ways. And I think that's what makes it so remarkable when you look at the turnaround. It starts at the line of scrimmage. Obviously, T-Mac is the best receiver in the country. You can make that argument, or if not one of the best. And then from a quarterback standpoint, you don't need Fafita to do, to do anything fancy. You just need him to move the the offense. And he doesn't get phased by anything. He plays like a veteran. He plays like a guy who's been out there for four or five years. And you trust that T-Mac and all your other skill position players will move the chains and get things done. So I think when you look at college football as a whole, right? I mean, we were talking about it before the, the pregame here, before going on, especially that top 10 stack up. I mean, I get there's Georgia, you know, I get there's Michigan, there's Ohio State and Florida State and all that good stuff. But five through 10, Mike, I think Arizona belongs somewhere in that in that realm. And if they're not broken, they're right there. Because again, this doesn't feel, there's nothing about this team that you go in and say, all right, that part stinks. You've got uh, three slow linebackers or you've got, Parker Zellers at every defensive line position. There's none of that. Where, If you're a team going against Arizona, where are you really attacking Arizona? Yeah, I, I don't know that there's an easy place to attack Arizona. I think Washington has probably done the best job where they just spread the field out and then they would just throw eight, 10-yard passes to go up and down the field. But that worked in the first half. Arizona made an adjustment. The second half, Washington couldn't move the ball. Right. They've also got you know, a Heisman finalist, NFL quarterback. So it when you think back to the start of the season, there hasn't been a team that's just moved the ball consistently all game up and down against Arizona. I guess maybe Colorado because we played a bunch of man and they were just running kind of crossing routes all over right, the field. Right, right. Yeah. But even then, Arizona was able to make just enough plays to win the game. I think this game, the play that kind of summed it up to me was it's third and eight in the first drive or whatever. They just clear out one side of the field. T-Mac runs a slant for a first down, which that you see in the NFL all the time. Mm. Best player on the field, isolate them, quick slant, easy first down. You can't stop it. Um, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best receiver in the country. Yeah, he definitely is the best for sure. Yeah. But T-Mac showed today, though, you can't play him one-on-one. Because if you do, it's basically a completion anytime they want to throw it. And he did that, too, against somebody. And again, I get Travis Hunter is playing... 10 billion snaps, but he also dominated Travis Hunter as well. I mean, this right. dude, there, there isn't a cornerback in the country that in single coverage is going to be able to uh, cover him. And that is, that's kind of where, that's kind of where it's at. All right. Now it's now time for the desert financial credit union by the numbers segment presented by desert financial credit union, Amer or Arizona's number one credit union named by Forbes. Um, this these this is a very uh, deceiving uh, stat line. These yeah. uh, with Utah, none of these plays were impactful. It didn't feel like Utah was able to really do anything they wanted. Where Arizona was very methodical in what they wanted to do. When uh, Arizona wanted to run the ball with Jonah Coleman, cool. When Arizona was able to get uh, wanted to get Michael Wiley involved, multiple touchdowns, cool. Like you said, T Mac was able to do his thing. Jacob Cowing um, didn't play as much as uh, Jacob Cowing didn't play as much as uh, uh, sometimes in the past. It didn't really matter though. Tanner McLaughlin got in there. Arizona. This is where stats can be deceptive at times. This uh, three hundred uh, or this stat line for Arizona. This was a much easier yardage uh, plateau than it was for uh, 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 Utah, Brogan. Well, and and I think that's what makes this Arizona team different than certainly the last seven, eight, nine years is I would say T Max, the only player on offense that has to kind of get his stuff for Arizona to go. Right. Cowing, McLaughlin, Green, whoever, one of those guys, uh, uh Craig, one of those guys will typically step the running backs, you got Coleman, you got Williams, you got um Wiley. Wiley. You have enough yeah. weapons where one of them can usually do some stuff. But, like, Fafita's just 
you know, we, we talked about this earlier with JDL is he only threw the ball to Cowling and T Mac. That's it. Right. Everybody with eats with Noah. Noah. Yeah, he's just looking at the field, seeing where the where the ball's supposed to go, and then he just makes plays. And so you don't really have to stress about where the ball's going, who's open, who's not, unless it's T Mac, and then you'll throw into coverage potentially because he's such a playmaker. But that's what makes their offense so dynamic is they can hurt you in a lot of different ways. And it starts with uh, Fafita and T-Mac and kind of works off of that. And and Ben, like Brogan said, you got the perfect orchestrator out there. We keep talking. We keep worrying about is Noah Fafita going to have this freshman game? Um, if last week's game against Colorado was the freshman game where you didn't play great in the first half and then you brought, brought him back in the second half, I'll take it. The dude's right. special. The dude's unique. And he's he's the perfect signal caller for what they want to do. Well, I just, well and John, and he, John Crowder said, hold on real quick. How was this game not nationally televised? I had the exact same thought when I pulled up the ASU Oregon game and saw it was on Fox and they stuck Arizona, Utah and Pac-12. Shame on the Pac-12 for that. That's why we're going to the Big 12. Yep. Rob, yeah, very good. Robbie makes the great, Robbie makes the same point as well. Um, ben yeah, go ahead, ben, sorry. No, you're good. Well, and, and that goes to show, too, what Brogan just said. I mean, Fafita plays the way he does, and he doesn't get rattled because he can play in so many different ways. I mean, he's not JDL in the sense that every time he drops back, he's looking for two guys. He's going deep. It's play action. It's it's improvised. It's I'm going to hold on to the ball way too long and, and chug it regardless. I mean, this guy gets the ball out quickly, whether they're running an RPO, whether it's a slant, whether it's a screen. There's not a play on the field or yardage on the field, rather, that he won't take. If he's got the ball and there's three or four yards ahead of him and he dumps it off to somebody like Michael Wiley, he will do that to keep the chains moving. And Arizona skill players will continue to move the ball upfield just because they play so well in space. I mean, Brogan talked about pro offense. You know, the way they played today, it wasn't anything spectacular. It was almost like watching Brock Purdy and the San Francisco 49ers just jump, dumping the ball off to your running back or your receiver and just trusting them to move the ball and, and make plays down the field. And I think that's what's so dynamic about about Noah is he's so lethal because he can beat you in just so many different ways. And from a talent standpoint, he's got an arm. And I think today, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, Arizona can only score, you know, 21 to 24 points a game. How is that going to fare against a, a dominant Utah defense or some of these better teams across the country? Well, guess what? Arizona put up 42 points today, Mike, and they looked uh, sure OK doing it. Arizona's not only doing that, Arizona's smacking these teams. Again, UCLA, we kept hearing last week about what a great defense they are. Arizona was essentially able to do what it wants. Um, same thing with Utah. You made a great point. Arizona is always ahead of the chains. The one thing with Jaden Delora, how many times did it feel like Arizona was in a second and 17, a third and 14? With Noah, it's always, if, you're, if you hit third down, it's always going to be third and four, third and six, second and seven. And for a guy like that, Brogan, that completes 85% of his passes or 95%, it seems, that's that's just going to pick you up all up and down all the field. Well, and I think it, you saw it in the game today, even third and six, third and seven, third and eight, for Arizona's passing game, that, that doesn't really put much stress on your offense because, again, a T-Max slant or you had the cross early to uh, Riley, I think it was, early yeah. in the game, third and ten or whatever. Fafita just has a knack at converting third downs, whether he's mobile in the pocket. He doesn't run too much, but that's good, though, because I think JDL had a bad habit of potentially bailing on the play beforehand, whereas Fafita's scrambling. People like right. Russell Wilson, he's yeah. scrambling to pass yeah. first no matter what, and then I'll run at the last minute. But he just has a knack to make plays on third down, which you can't really teach that, and that's why he's having such a big season. Yeah, and all right, now let's get to the uh, the defense, though, because, again, that to me was still kind of the uh, – that was still kind of the uh, the big part of the game. Um, why don't we go to the A factor right now, which is the defense. Um, the defense, 10 points allowed, two interceptions, and those interceptions were huge. But how many times when Utah was throwing the ball did it feel like they were throwing into double coverage? Did it feel like they were throwing into triple coverage or the ball looked like he was about to get uh, uh, batted? It always felt like Utah was on, even on a pass that was completed, Ben, it never felt like it was easy. It always felt like Utah was really having to stretch things to make that work. Well, that's what happens when you have the secondary covered and then you have the pass rush taken care of. I mean, 
Arizona had a very good defensive game plan. I mean, hats off to Nansen because it would have been really easy to sell out on the pass and go all in on just rushing the passer. And they didn't do that. They had a good balance and goes back to talent, right? I mean, Stukes is a really good defensive back. Maldonado made a lot of plays as well. They have a really good secondary. And Arizona was able to get in the face of Utah pretty much, you know, the majority of that game. But there were times where Arizona was more focused on a, you know, a coverage standpoint and Utah just had nowhere to go with the ball. I mean, Barnes did have times where there were snaps and plays throughout the game where he had, you know, five, six seconds and he just couldn't find anywhere to go. And as a result, you saw Norton, you saw Upshaw, you even saw Dalton Johnson get in the face of uh, Byron Barnes there um, throughout most of that game. And Arizona had a really good balanced plan on the defensive side. I think they made it clear from the get go that they were going to try to get to the passer. But at the same time, the secondary held up. And as a result, Utah loves to live on those chunk easy yard throws in the sense a lot like Arizona and those were taken away underneath there wasn't really anywhere to go with the ball and I think that's why you saw the offense for Utah have to pivot a little bit I mean they did try a couple trick plays they got their other quarterback in as well just because he's a little bit more of a dynamic runner but from an offensive standpoint Utah had no idea what to do tonight Mike Right. Tony Jones, Tony Jones, we need, we, we've missed you the last couple shows, Tony Jones. Great to see you in here, AJ Jones Pops. All right, first, we also want to help you make some money. Big, Here's a big thing. Put Go to BetMGM. You will thank me later, my friends. They've got all kinds of good stuff going on. Right now, you can put down $10 and you will receive $200 instantly in additional winnings, regardless of your wager's outcome. Check out the show notes for details. Again, sign up for BetMGM. Use bonus code PHNX. Place your first uh, place your first sportsbook wager through BetMGM Sportsbook mobile app of at least $10. You will receive $200 instantly in additional winnings, regardless of your wager's outcome. Check out the show notes for details. Let's hear Shane Diefenbach with the description. Link problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Colorado, D.C., Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, New Jersey, Nevada, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, Wyoming. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369-NEW YORK. Call 1-800-327-5050, Massachusetts. 21 plus to wager. Please gamble responsibly. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP, Arizona. 1-800-BETS-OFF, Iowa. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help, Michigan. 1-800-981-0023, Puerto Rico, in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. U.S. promotional offers not available in D.C., New York, or Ontario. All right, we're going to get back to the game, but we got to talk about keeping Jed Fish around. Uh, Brogan and I talked uh, about this for about 40 minutes uh, today, uh, uh, just driving around. Listen, um, Arizona's never going to be able to offer a coach $11 million or whatever the case may be. But Arizona absolutely needs to get that up into the five uh, the five million realm, which I believe they can do. Um, and part of it's also going to be how much Jed Fish values and listen, I, and Brogan and I were talking about this. Let's just use Florida as an example. If Florida were to go to, uh, or if you were to go to Florida, he becomes, he'll, he'll always be the third best coach there. Again, it's awesome to be able to do that. But what he's got going here at Arizona is he can be the Lou Olson of Arizona football. And there's something to be said that if he's going to be the Lou Olson of Arizona football, and you're going into the big 12, this is a loaded team. There's a lot to like about staying right here in the desert, Ben. Well, there's also a lot to lose, right, by leaving right now, given everything you've built. I mean, you started at rock bottom at 1-11, and and you've turned this into what very well may be with a bowl team, a bowl win, a 10-win team. I mean, right now, it could be a 10-win team. They lost in triple overtime uh, to USC. They lost so closely to Washington, so... Yeah, we just have to find out if this is something that I think Fish wants to do. And by all indications, it sounds like they are working on the extension. They are working on getting that pay up. But yeah, I mean, how special is it and how cool is it to come in here just given the state of this program before you took over and the fact that they haven't had really any level of success from a sustainability standpoint since the late 90s? I mean, how cool is it to come in here and do what you've done. And look, you've proven, you know, over the last two years that you can get players and win at Arizona. And I think when you look at some of these other options that may be becoming uh, opening here in terms of jobs and what maybe we're going to be looking at, Arizona's going into the Big 12. They return the good majority of this roster next year. I totally get you're going to lose a few guys, but Fafita's back. That foundation on the offensive and defensive line 
are going to be back for the most part. And you've got good players in the waiting who also are contributing uh, this year. So obviously they'll have bigger roles with years to come. So I think it's a really hard thing, Mike, with everything you've done so far just to get up and walk away. Now I get it if Michigan calls, which you know won't happen, or maybe a team like Florida, we know his roots there. But at the same time, I don't, I don't, I'm not too worried about it because Arizona has the best coach it can possibly have. The program's in a great place, and that's everything you want as a fan. All right, now I got to. Uh, Tad is a dissing on Lute Olson, right? Uh, and that's not going to happen here. It won't be tolerated. Will not be. Uh-oh. Lute Olson is the reason that uh, Lute Olson is the most influential person in Tucson sports era. And, uh, is the best coach in Arizona sports history, whether that is, uh, and I'm talking about revenue sports, pe- things that people watch. Um, he just is. He is the most successful. He inherited, he came here off a of four and 24 season. He turned Arizona into a top 15 program. He's one of the 15 best coaches to ever walk a college basketball sideline. Yes, he had one championship. That's probably a reason that he's not in the top five to seven. But Lute Olson is one of the 15 best coaches that ever walked a college basketball sideline. And trying, and this is with all due respect, trying to compare him to Frank Sanset or, uh, you know, and again, Jerry Kindle, and that's with all due respect. Um, that is, uh, that's that's just silly. One championship loot, that's, uh, we can do better than that. I'll put it to you like that. <laughs> um, Lute Olson is, a, the, you can make the case Lute Olson is the most influential person in Tucson history, period, because of how he turned that into, because of what he turned the city into. And that's, I think, what Jed Fish has a little bit of that possibility here when it comes to Arizona football. Whatever you do, and again, Dick Tomey had some good teams, but whatever you do, Arizona, uh, um, Jed Fish, if you turn this into a consistent program, you will be known as the dude that made that program. And there's something to be said for that. If Lute Olson had got Lute Olson had multiple times, he could have gone to Kentucky. Well, you know, as great as Lute Olson was, it's still going to be Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Oh, it's still going to be Adolf Rupp. It's going to be dudes like that. <laughs> That's terrible. Can you imagine Adolf Hitler coaching basketball? Yeah, basketball. <laughs> yeah, he was he was a disciplinarian. Um, but. <laughs> But there is something to be said, making this your own program. And honestly, as much as we love our Big 12 fans, and I am ecstatic to go to the Big 12, Arizona can compete very favorably in the Big 12. And with the way that this uh, the college football playoffs has expanded, there is an easy route for Arizona if you get the right t- uh, type of talent. Yeah, and I think Arizona need. I mean, he makes three, a little over $3 million today. If they can get him to $5 million with his extension, then he comes back next year wins the big 12 or finishes top two in the big 12 wins 10 games again. Right. Then Dave has something to be able to go to boosters with and say, Hey, we need to be in the 7 million range. And then people start to listen at that point because now he's got momentum. And if you get him in the $7 million range, crazy to say at Arizona, basketball, football, whatever. But if you get him in the $7 million range, then you eliminate basically all, but like the top 10 jobs in the country at that point. right? Right. If Ohio state, Michigan, some of those schools ever want Jed Fish, they're going to pay him 12, 15 million. Well, congrats to Jed Fish. Yeah. But there's a path to him being in Arizona long term, even if he's going to have a tough decision to make if Arizona gets into the $7 million range with something like Florida. Again, we know that's his yeah. thing yeah. between that and UCLA. Yeah. But do you want to go be sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth in the SEC, or would you rather be first or second in the Big 12? That's a pretty, that's something he'll have to weigh because the money will be comparable. It's hard to win in the SEC no matter where you're at, unless you're Alabama or Georgia. At this point. It's really hard to win. And this is a loaded roster. And Jed Fish is going to be continue to get players. And um, no, regardless of what people say, I think it's also fair to say that Jed Fish does a very good job of um, developing players, dare I say. Um, he's been able to... Uh, Listen, he had the one 2022 class. It was amazing, but he's been able to build on that. I don't even really worry about re- uh, recruiting rankings with him necessarily because, listen, he's going to get players that are either big, fast, and if he's going to miss, he's going to miss on players that are big and fast. He's shown that he can develop these players. Look at some of these dudes who are three who were three stars that are uh, that are you know starting and playing uh, major minutes. Jonas Sabanea. Granted, that was a that was a recruiting uh, miss by the. Uh, um, that was a recruiting miss by the services. But Wendell Moy, um, uh, Tai Tai Uyagalele, uh, you know, um, uh, Jonah Coleman. I can keep going. Uh, Takario Davis, another perfect example. Jacob Manu. This staff knows how to develop talent, and they know what they're looking for. 
100%. Yeah. And they 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 have that mind that they have that player mold in mind, right? And I think with the way that Fish runs his teams, I think it's really hard for a good player, especially a skill player to turn down an opportunity like this just because what we talked about earlier, everybody on this offense gets the ball. Yeah. Um, I don't care if you're T-Mac. I don't care if you're a third string wide receiver. You're going to get in the game. And who wouldn't want to be a part of that on the defensive side? Same story, right? You got transfers and, you know, you maybe thought initially going into the year, well, it's going to be heavily predicated on Norton and Upshaw. Granted, it has been very important for those guys to be as good as they have, but we've seen other guys get into the mix. So I think with the way they play and I think with the way that Fish has kind of run his transfer portal slash NIL strategy, um, it's a very appealing place to play. And then when you look at the Big 12 next year, um, especially kids out West because they've done such a great job in California and areas out here. I think from a football standpoint, the best opportunity you have to compete and win football games is going to be in that conference. It's not going to be by going to UCLA to be a freshman third string linebacker. And you're going to the big 10 where you've got a huge uphill battle in front of you. I think right now it makes the most sense to go to a program like Arizona, where you go to the big 12, it's a fun style all the football programs, by and large, for the most part, are fun in the sense that there's offense, there's scoring, and I think it's just a really good time. And they say timing is everything, right? I think it's a really good time for Jed Fish and what he's trying to do out here. All right, real quick, I want to. People are asking about Elijah Rushing and Keona Wilhite. Yes, I do believe there's a chance they get Wilhite. Uh, I'm not going to say this, but uh, PB. Um, to me, there's a huge difference. Will, uh, Rushing's family dragged Arizona through the, I mean, not Elijah, but his father dragged Arizona through the mud. Um, I would not bring back Elijah Rushing under any circumstances. And again, it's not the kid's fault. That's the father's fault. Keona Wilhite decommitted. That's, that's part of the game. If Keona Wilhite wanted to come back to the U of A, I would take him with open, uh, I would take him with open arms. Kids decommit. You're a 17-year-old. You're new to it. I would 100% be okay with uh, bringing back Keona Wilhite. To me, there's a drastic, uh, uh, there's a drastic uh, difference when it comes to that. And let's talk about Johnny Nansen. That was just brought up. Listen, Johnny Nansen was uh, drugged through the mud last year. Um, I think obviously bringing in Dwayne Aquina helped, but this dude's got this defense on lock right now, Brogan. Um, there's not much you can do with this defense. No, and I think you know last year our defense was. One of, I mean, the worst in the Pac-12, one of the worst right. in the country. And then it turns around this year where you could make the case that they're a top 10 kind of overall defense in the country, best defense in the Pac, certainly. Um, part of it is the transfer portal. Part of it is just another year of talent developing, right? right? When you've got Manu and Prysock and a lot of those younger guys coming up. But Arizona this year on defense has settled in, in the past – how many times were we screaming at the TV, just blitz, just blitz, just blitz, because we couldn't get any pressure on the quarterback? Or like, why did we blitz? We just left guys wide open because we couldn't cover. This is the first year in a long time where we can get pressure with four guys right. pretty consistently. We can play normal defense and blitz when it's appropriate or or kind of a surprise tactic. We can play zone. We can play man. So finally, I think the talent has caught up enough to allow Nansen to kind of coach normal football as opposed to always having to think about, man, I got a blitz to bring pressure. I can't get pressure the way, or, Hey, I've got to play zone. Cause I can't cover. And now guys are just making plays and it makes your, it makes your job a lot easier as a coach. If, if your players can go make plays for you, for sure. For sure. Now, Justin flow has been asked, here's the deal with Justin flow. Um, and a guy on a guy on Shears board, uh, put this and I think this is actually a pretty good, uh, pretty good way of putting it. Um, the idea of Justin flow is probably a little bit better than the actual impact. Now, again, he definitely has some impactful moments, but he is totally lost in pass coverage. I think it was last game where he came in and he immediately uh, he immediately got stuck behind a, a blocker, gave up a touchdown. That's where, again, he he's got some real he's got some real talent, but there's also some big limitations with him, and I think that's what that's always going to be the case. Um, how much does Nansen get? And then there's Carol. Fish needs support and hasn't won a bowl yet. Um, coming from uh, ASU is obviously concerned about this. Um, but Johnny Nansen is uh, – Johnny Nansen's got to get paid. Um, and that's the price of success. And this is a good problem for people to have because how many times have we uh, talked about Arizona football coaches and it's like this is the place where coaches go to die. Dick Tomey, 
got another job, but it was San Jose State. Mike Stoops still living with his brother. Um, Kevin Sumlin, obviously not sure how he got another job, but he got another job as an OC. We saw what happened there. Rich Rod is at Jackson State. The fact that this dude is going to be wanted is a good thing, people, a very good thing. And I think we shouldn't lose track of that. Well, him, Nansen and um, Brandon Carroll, I mean, both of those guys, I mean, this is what happens when your offense and defense play the way that they have. And, you know, I think to piggyback off the the Nansen point, I think I think obviously he's somebody who has brought a lot to the table. And, you know, he's somebody who spent time with Fish at UCLA and he's been all around. But I think from a culture perspective, point of view i think arizona's done a terrific job on that defensive side just really building the staff with culture in mind i'll give you an example right cecil is on the staff he's your assistant db coach right you look at somebody like Dwayne aquino we were talking about him a lot against colorado just because the tv kept showing him getting in the face and getting in the huddles and then amping guys up and correcting them and obviously you look up front to on the defensive line as well just with some of these other coaches and ricky hunley as well you know defense has always been what has carried arizona during its time of success and i'm glad that fish you know among a number of different other guys on that staff recognized it and for the first time you know we've talked about it over the years oh you should bring cecil on the staff and someone did that he just gave him a, a spot on the staff but you could tell it wasn't truly impactful at, compared to what he's doing right now but this is the first time i think mike and you've talked about it when when fish came here and over the last two years it's the first time a coach has really come in here and said i want to get this culture i want to be arizona football and how do you do that you bring in guys who are successful who know the program like the back of their hand and have been around when times have been good and i think from a coaching perspective, I think 70% of the battle is culture and just having that presence around. It's definitely helped them. Yeah, Ben, you just hit the nail on the head, and I actually texted you about that as well. Um, this is, Brogan, these guys look like they expect to win. They expect to, uh, they don't expect to go in there and get their butts beat. They expect to win games, and that is a that's a big thing. How many times, even with Rich Rod, I went into almost every game against a good team, and I'm like, well, we need this to go right. We need this to go right. This team expects to beat you. You can tell by the swag this staff has they expect to win. Yeah, and and just to kind of hit back on Ben's point a little bit, Fish took a lot of flack for his coaching staff when he got hired. Right. But considering he had never been a head coach before, Arizona was in a really bad spot after someone left. But again, Fish has a knack for being able to identify talent from a player standpoint. He can clearly identify a coaching staff of guys who can coach. I mean, Scotty Graham, he took a ton of flack for Scotty Graham. He's never coached got, before. Right. We've got a great, you know, running back room and things of that nature. So, but I was thinking the exact same thing about the team, watching them kind of come out of the tunnel on TV for the Utah game. It was instantly you, you kind of had that for the first time in a long time of like, you know what, this does feel like a game that Arizona is going to win because we just have a ton of talent. Whereas in the past, this game would have been like, well, we're, we've got momentum, but this is the momentum stopper because we see it every year. We win two or three games, we hit a good team, and we lose. We get blown out a lot of those times. Right. But this team is just different. All right, uh, Gorilla Tech. Um, I'm going to disagree with you, my guy. I, I totally get some of the criticism about Robbins being rah-rah and being, I will still take a president every single day of the week that actually likes sports. I will, I will, you know, if he's up in the player's face, I, I'm, I'm cool with that because I would much rather have a president, a president navigating this situation that cares about sports as opposed to one that doesn't understand streaming. Hey, look, um, you either yeah. love Jerry Jones or you hate Jerry Jones and Robbins is a little bit of that for Arizona, but the majority of fans love the Jerry Jones style of being involved and caring way more than the Oregon state president or the Washington state president who basically got left out in the cold because they don't care about athletics. Right. And so yeah. we'd much rather have somebody who's in the face caring and being, you know, visual and all that. Um, I think it's great for Arizona personally. And especially Ben, I mean, he navigated a tough spot where a lot of people, listen, if, uh, if Michael Crow was also the president at uh, U of A, I, I think that we're probably in the same spot that our, uh, fr our Mountain West friends, Oregon State and Washington State. Can we not imagine that, please? Can we please not imagine <laughs> that? Right. But <laughs> let's just say that you want to go watch a Mountain West game coming up in the future and you don't know where to get tickets. 
I can tell you where to get tickets for these games. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code PHNX for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code PHNX for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute prices or tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Check it out. Game Time. Um, the other thing, too, that uh, we also need to talk about is that Arizona can wear you down. And this is from pretty much position by position. Um, Let's look at the running backs. You guys both mentioned uh, about how deep Arizona is at that running back stable. Then at the wide receiver, you had Jacob Cowan go out of a game uh, last week. Guess what? You put in Kevin Green, he immediately catches a pass. You've got Malachi Riley. You got AJ Jones. You've had uh, you've had games where Robert P- or excuse me Raymond Polito was out. You put in Lange. You put in Borjon. D on the defensive side, you've got eight defensive linemen, it seems, between uh, Isaiah Ward, between um, uh, Taylor Upshaw, who was huge, by the way, uh, Uyaga Lele, Manoa, Tia Savea, uh, Big Bill Norton. This team is deep, and that's where the really good teams hit you, when they can keep coming at you in waves where Arizona's not reliant on just one player outside of maybe Noah Fafita. It, and I think the perfect example, and it's funny enough, you play Utah. That's why a team like Utah has been so dominant in this conference for so long. Arizona has done exactly that this year. Like you said, they have so many different options. They have a plethora of guys on both sides of the ball, and it's nothing flashy. It's it's nothing spectacular to watch in the sense that it stands out. Right. It's just really good fundamental. We're going to beat you up, and we're more tough than you football. And it comes down to the line of scrimmage. We've been saying it all year long. You know, you win games and you lose them at the line of scrimmage. And Arizona, despite the fact that they've had some good skill players over the last decade or so, they've had good players come in and out. The line of scrimmage has always been a disaster for them on both sides of the yeah. ball, offense and defensive lines. And when you get that corrected, it can make up a lot of the other challenges and maybe some of the deficiencies that you have. But at the same time, Arizona doesn't really have any issues because they have so many different guys on the offensive side who can get out and score you points. So uh, this is definitely the most well-rounded roster we've seen in quite a while. And I get that Oregon is, is very good. I'm not comparing them to them. And I get that Washington has been successful. Granted, they've struggled late. Lately, but in terms of balance, guys, this might be the most balanced roster in the entire conference. I, uh, Brogan, let's talk about where Arizona stacks up in the conference. I think that Oregon's probably the best team, um, the way they're annihilating. I'd like another chance at Wash. I'd like another chance at Washington. Um, I think with Noah Fafita having a seven, eight games under his belt, the way that Arizona came back in that second half. We need some things to happen, but it's not that outlandish that Arizona could be playing Washington in the uh, uh, Pac-12 championship game. Yeah, I mean, USC after the Arizona game kind of took a nosedive. I think we would smoke USC if we played them yes. again because their defense yeah. can't stop anybody. Um, Oregon, I think, is – Oregon is – we talked about this earlier. Washington is undefeated. Um, they got a tough game today with Oregon State, but again, they've kind of already paved their path to the Pac-12 right. title game. But I think Oregon's playing the best football by far in the Pac. Um, so I don't know that I'd want to see Oregon if we're Arizona, but they got a rivalry game next week. Oregon State, the as good as we're playing, I'll never be totally comfortable going into the Arizona State game because we've seen too many times the worst yeah. team in that game come out ahead because of the rivalry. It's kind of the same in the right. Oregon Oregon State game, but. The only team I'm afraid of in the pack right now is Oregon. I think Arizona can totally play with Washington, and I think they're pretty much better than everybody else in the pack, which is really weird to say, but that's kind of where we're at. And they're better across – again, they're better across the board. So what for everybody uh, everybody out there, we need Oregon State to beat Oregon next, uh, next week. If Oregon State beats Oregon, Arizona somehow has the tiebreaker, which we will take. We deserve that tiebreaker, and I'll take my chances against Washington. Like you said, um, Arizona State – you always want to take it seriously because it's a rivalry game. But I'm also at the point, if you don't beat Oregon State or Arizona State, you don't deserve to uh, be in the Pac-12 title game, rivalry or not. So that's kind of where I'm at with that one there, Ben. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, ASU is really bad. But like Brogan said, you never know in these situations. And with the way Oregon State's been playing lately, who knows? You know, maybe maybe Oregon uh, has their foot off the gas a little bit. They they already know where they kind of stand. And, you know, we've seen crazier things happen. So you've got to ro- root for Oregon State next week. And it's funny we mentioned the conference and how weird it is to say that, you know, this team is clearly probably the second best behind Oregon. But 
yeah, we talked about it earlier in the show, but I mean, outside of what Michigan, you know, Ohio State, Georgia, outside of that, Mike, I have a hard time, and I may be getting a little ahead of myself here. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I have a hard time seeing Arizona not be competitive or take on some of these other teams if they were throughout college let's, football. Let's play that game. Which teams in the, which teams in college football right now are clearly better? Not, you know, eh, I guess I'd, I'd probably favor them. Which teams are clearly better? And first thing is first, though, Shady Rays, my friends. All right, Shady Rays. Now, you might be like John Brogan, and you're running into it. You make a lot of money, and you got a lot of cool stuff. I guarantee you that he has a pair of Shady Rays, and if he doesn't, that's his fault, my friends. Exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use code PHNX for 50% off two-plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people and OGs, my friends. All right, let's say you got a big headache or something, or you need a little bit of a help sleeping. OGs is here. Just head to ZenLeafDispensaries.com. Find your closest location. Order your favorite OGs gummies. For a uh, pickup and enter discount code PHNX to get 20% off and check out. This deal is exclusive to our PHNX listeners. And reminder, it's available only for online pickup orders. Discount code PHNX is active until November 30th. Okay. Which um which player, which teams are clearly... Oh, our ASU friend Tad is back in here. All right. How's that ASU score, buddy? Um, <laughs> Let's... uh, Which teams are clearly better? All right. We'll start. Georgia clearly better than Arizona. I don't think we'll uh, Ben White. Do you want to argue that? <laughs> I do not. Okay. Georgia's clearly better. Ohio State clearly better. Um, I think right now Oregon clearly better. Um, Michigan clearly better. Yeah, as much as I hate to say it, they're better. Yeah. Um, How about Florida State? I'm Florida I'm State's I go back better. and forth on this one. You Florida think State's Florida State? Florida State's yeah. better. the The thing about Florida State, though, is they're they're a little bit kind of like some of those Big Ten teams that they don't really play anybody. They haven't right beaten now, anybody, yeah, outside LSU. But yeah. right now, I would um uh, I, I I would say Florida State's better. Um, that's after that though is where I mean Bama. Um, Every, yeah. everybody else, you can start to really question. Texas, it's a conversation, Alabama, yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's what's why just, just yeah. think about what you just said. Just think about what you just said for a second. I know. That's what's wild and that's what's amazing about what's uh um what's well, what's this, this comes back to a conversation we have regularly, which is which schools have the best combo of football, basketball? Now Arizona's in the conversation. Dude, Arizona's right there, along with our friends at our future big friends, uh, big 12 friends in Kansas, right. which is still right. which is still wild to say. Um all right, Tad, I have a pre-law degree from U of A. Well, that doesn't make up for being an ASU fan either way. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. I think there's about five, six, maybe seven teams. Other than that, it starts to get really interesting. And I think Arizona is squarely going to be in the top 15 when these uh, when this next ranking these next rankings come out. Because, again, this wasn't a 10 to 7 victory. This wasn't some Iowa score. This was an, this was an ass kicking. Um, this was just an ass kicking. And quite frankly, those, uh, those Utah would not have even had, uh, this score was actually a lot closer than it really, it really was just because of those late, uh, those kind of those late bum touchdowns at the end there. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, from, from start to finish, Arizona dominated this game. They were the better team. It was clear in the scoreboard. It was clear what you were watching tonight. And I think, it's just so crazy when you look back at the way this season started and some of these closer games and you thought, well, Arizona should have the Mississippi State game and they could have had the USC game. But I think we were all expecting if Arizona was going to win this game tonight, Mike, it would be something like that. It would be a one or two score possession. Arizona would have to go all in on both sides of the ball and, and also get lucky at times just because we felt that there might have been a chance that Utah could have worn down Arizona, but Arizona was the team wearing down Utah, and it was uh, just completely reversed. Uh, Tony Clifton right here. Uh, this is uh, this is true, Tony Clifton. I have many degrees. Yes, this is true. <laughs> um, they, they haven't really served uh, me in the fields that I'm in, but either way, uh, either way, we will, we will take that. Um, all right. I like getting ahead of myself just a little bit here because I think it does pertain to the future. Again, let's just look. 
let's just look at this roster for next year and what we're talking about with Jed Fish, because here's where it gets really fascinating and where I think that you have to really be careful if you're fish on what you do with your next move. You got no Fafita at quarterback. Um, I know Chief says that it'll be an open co uh, competition with Dorman and uh, Fafita. Guess what? It's not. Um, at uh, running back, Jonah Coleman. Uh, Jonah Coleman's back. He's an NFL player. Uh, I think Ray, I think Speedy Luke Fam is going to uh, make a nice little jump. Uh, wide receiver, you got T Mac back. I would be surprised if T Mac isn't the best wide receiver in the country next year. And as much as I gave him some grief and didn't understand why he was playing, Montana Lamonius Craig has really stepped it up these past couple yep. weeks. There's there's really no other way around it. Um, at uh, tight end, I, uh, Kean Burnett. Uh, Keen Burnett, I think, will be able to make that jump. You don't like losing Tanner McLaughlin. On the O-line, you lose Jordan Morgan. That's certainly a loss, but you return uh, you return Sabinea, you return Moy, you return uh, Josh Baker, you return Polito. Then on the defensive side, you have uh, you re you lose uh, you lose Taylor Upshaw. Certainly a loss. Guess what? You return back everybody. You put yep. Deuce Davis back there along with Isaiah Ward. Then at linebacker, you return everybody. The secondary... This is a loaded team, fellas, and this is a team that I would be very curious how many teams have a better roster going into 2024 than Arizona football. I said it. Well, and we get to take this loaded roster into the Big 12, which right. will be a little easier than the Pac-12, considering you have Oregon, Washington, and, and I guess USC, potentially. Right. But in the Big 12, it's really Kansas, it's Utah, it's Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. And that's about it. But none of those teams are you looking at the beginning of the season saying, eh, we don't have a chance, whereas you might say that with Oregon in the past or Washington. Right. So Arizona likely goes into next season as a top 15 team for sure and probably the odds on favorite to win the Big 12, in my opinion. I, I think they are as well, which is yeah. just wild to think Crazy. about. Um, and because uh, here's the thing, and I, I know I've said this before, I'm going to keep saying it again because every now and then I make a good point. There's not a team that with a style that if you're Arizona that you need to stay away from where right. it's, oh, yeah. well, oh, they're really big up front. They're that big down. Now, granted, you don't want to play Georgia. I mean, <laughs> but this is – there is no team that you are scared of. There's no team that – um or a style of play that you're like, we can't handle this one. And some of the guys you got to get back. Big Bill Norton, don't care what it takes. Get him an NIL. Um, Utifo, you're the man. Get him some money. We need him back. Um, uh, but again, you're big, you're strong, you're physical. And this thing, I don't care what Jed Fish or Dave Hickey says, this thing is definitely going faster than they thought it was. Um, this was, this is a squad that, and yes, all Kansas state for, I like Chris Kleiman a great deal as well. Kansas state's another one. They're always going to be hovering around that top 25, but this is overall though. There's not a team out there that I don't think that I would, let me put it to you like this. There's not a roster out there that I would take, um, over Arizona's going into next year there, uh, Brogan and Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I'm you go, Ben. You go. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you look at too, I mean, just the, the style of play these teams play as well. I mean, this is a fun conference to be in just because you have a lot of um, up tempo there and you have a lot of offense and Arizona's defense is going to be in a prime position because when we talk about big 12 football, you know, historically, and even with some of these new teams you're adding, what's always been the challenge. It's, it's stopping people. It's, it's defense. Yeah. And, I think Arizona has the clear advantage, even if they're not able to consistently score, you know, 40 to 45 points a game, you know, like an Oklahoma State, like a Texas Tech. I don't think it's going to matter just because on the defensive end, you're so balanced. And I get that ASU's coming, Colorado's coming, but there's a lot of interesting matchups here, you know, and it'll really give you a taste to just see how good this program is. And I think you've seen it this year, just with the way they've played. And, and this is certainly the statement win of the year, if you ask me, but yeah, I mean, they're going to be in a good spot. I think, you know, from a football standpoint, it, it's going to matter a lot more than maybe it ever has. And TCU is fun to play. Kansas State, like Saul mentioned, they're they're no easy opponent. But these are football programs a lot of times, and um, you haven't been able to say that historically outside of you know USC and, and Oregon and UCLA and and Washington. I think the conference is very well balanced compared right. to what you have right now. Brogan, what I also like about Jed Fish is that Jed Fish is petty in a good way. 
Jedfish remembers if you said something about him. That's why he always brings up player development. I absolutely love that. What I am hoping happens is I hope that they run the score up against ASU. I don't care what anybody says. Um, with everything that we've heard, um, with everything that he's, I want Arizona to try to go in there and again, don't knock on wood. Don't want to take it for granted. I want Arizona to try to smack the snot out of them and keep the uh, keep the gas on for four quarters. Well, I think part of it will be maintaining your kind of momentum, right? Because they're coming off four straight wins or they beat four ranked opponents, but they've just been dominating the Pac-12 for the last four weeks. So I don't think they want to risk losing momentum because they get conservative in that game if they get it by a couple touchdowns. Yeah, But yeah, at the same time, I, I have to assume if Jed Fish is willing to throw a bomb to T-Mac in the last 47 seconds of the Utah game, that he's definitely willing to try to drop 70 on ASU. So I'm excited to see. And, and Arizona's offense has the ability to score 50, 60, 70 points because, again, they got big plays. They got players who can make plays all over the field. I don't like I don't like it when – listen, I understand why some coaches take the high road. I don't like it, though, in this day and age when somebody – when you're playing your rival, again, ASU's job is to stop you, not for you to stop yourself. Or when you get a parent coming out and bashing you – you don't need to address the parent directly, but I'm more than okay with dressing him indirectly, especially when it's nonsense that they're throwing out there. I am more than okay with that. Speaking of which, um, check out, go to the, uh, be part of the takeover up there. The great Saul Bookman boss of everything will be up there representing the Wildcats. Have a lot of uh, ASU people going there. We need to get some Arizona folks in here as well. Check it out. Be part of the PHNX takeover. Uh, best in the city. Arizona's better than ASU. We need to get in there, get in there, check it out on go PHNX. You will, uh, you will not, uh, you will not be sorry that you did that. Um, now, uh, UFO professional ass kicking. That's exactly what, uh, we're looking for. Um, also one thing that we need also need to keep talking about and this Arizona budget, there is so much misinformation that has been going around. I get people every day that say, well, your athletic department's in a uh, $240 million uh, uh, deficit hole. That is not that. First of all, it was money that the school was hoping that they were going to have that they're either going to have to pay back or they um, that they're going to have to pay back. But either way, this does not affect the athletic department in any way, shape, or form. Dave Hickey has told me that many, many times. And you know what, Dave, as you guys definitely know behind the scenes, Dave, when he tells me something, it's definitely been gold. There um, was a good tweet, though, Mike. Did you see it from Alejandro Alvarez when he tweeted, Arizona is playing like $240 million and rent is due? That was very funny. Yes. I, I give them a lot of credit. This is not going to affect, this is not going to impact the money that they uh, would otherwise have to be able to get uh, their coaches paid. They know what they got to do. Um, so again, uh, this is the bigger structural issue here is that Arizona was essentially paying kids that could get into UC Davis. They were giving them 80% scholarships to come here. And when you're a 2.4 or five GPA, you're not getting a lot of bang back on your buck there. So it's something they got to figure out. They did take out a loan during COVID, but at the same time, I don't really, uh, I, I can't really blame them for that. The athletic department is just fine financially. And like you said, Brogan, um, Arizona, if you can get Jed fish into that $5 million, uh, uh, range this season, I also think it becomes a little bit easier next year. If you have two straight back to back years, to show people, listen, this isn't some Arizona football flash in the pan. We're here. Um, I think it becomes a little bit easier to bump him up into that $7 million realm at that point. Yeah. And I think, yeah, for sure. And, and that money will come from boosters primarily like Arizona will go out and source that money. It's not going to have anything to do with the, right. you know, cash reserves that everybody's making a big stink about when technically your reserves are for when you can't pay your bills, not when you have to pay your normal bills. So that's, that's a bunch of nothing there. Real quick, but, Brogan, you're a gambler. You're a, you're a heavy gambler. AZ Wildcat fan, the great AZ Wildcat fan. Have U of A appearing in the Pac-12 title game at plus 7,000? What do I do now? Oh, I'm riding that one, buddy. You just need one thing to happen. You need Oregon State to beat Oregon. Right, but what you do, what you really do is you, whatever you're set to win on that bet, you go bet half on Oregon to beat Oregon State next week. Right. That way you're guaranteed a winner either way. 
Yeah, either way, you deserve that win, my friend. Uh, but, but Brogan, sorry for interrupting. What were you saying? No, no, I was just going to come back to somebody made a comment about Arizona losing players to the NIL because typically when you're a below average team and you get better, I actually think in a weird way that Fish is going to be able to sell the Dorian Singer and the Keon Bars and the Roland Wallace transfers as yeah. like, the grass that, ain't always greener if you leave Arizona, right? You might right. get a little more money, but you might be sitting on the, you might be averaging one or two catches a game. Right, right. And so now I think Arizona will be able to sell players on potentially a little less money. They're going to still have to pay players, obviously, but a little less money, but being able to play and being able to be on a winner versus running to the, you know, the next shiny thing, which last year was USC. All of a sudden they're going to be, you know, a six or seven win team where Arizona's going to win 10 games. So, I think I think that makes Jed Fish's sales pitch a little easier to existing players. They were never going to lose T Mac or right. those guys because they all came to Arizona for a reason. But um, you look at somebody like Prysock, mm -hmm. right? People could throw a lot of money at him, but I don't think there anybody's going anywhere because what Arizona's built and the culture that Jed Fish has. Um, yeah, it's going to get interesting. All right. For sure. all right, real quick about culture. You might look at Ben White making all that money in Orange County or John Brogan essentially running into it and saying, hmm, they must live really large. I'd like to live like them. I've got the answer for you. Gila River Resorts and Casinos, my friends. Don't live like me. Live like these two gents. Here's the cool. Visit GilaMillionDollarsShowdown.com to get in on the action. For more information on Gila River Resorts and Casinos and all they have to offer, head to play at Gila.com. Live a very, very fun time. Play fun free games online for a chance to win $1 million. And, and the very cool thing about this is that it's the best resorts and casinos in all of Arizona. You will thank me later. All right, guys, before we sign off, Arizona beat the snot out of Utah. I didn't think that in, uh, when Jed Fish was hired two and a half years in, I would be saying that Arizona just beat the snot out of Utah and that it wasn't a fluke. <laughs> ben White, Sean Brogan, sum it up better than I did. <laughs> Arizona beat the snot out of Utah. They dominated from get-go, from start to finish. They were the better team at the line of scrimmage. They had the better quarterback. They had the better receivers. And they just flat out had no issue moving the ball. And I think that's what goes to show you the the big margin here when it comes to the score of 42 to 18 that, you know, Fafita threw two touchdowns, the receivers made plays in space, and it just, it came easy to them. And I'm going to steal Brogan's line if the rain didn't start. They're probably scoring 70 points in this game. Much better team today. John Brogan, 1290? Yeah. Four wins against ranked teams were one, you know, Oregon loss away from being in the Pac-12 title game two years after we lost to NAU. And so you have to give Fish all the credit. Um, we were talking about Fish as a play caller earlier. They've got the lowest three and out percentage in the country. So Fish as a recruiter, as a developer, as a play caller, he's kind of A's across the board at this point. And yep. so we just got to keep riding the wave because at Arizona, it typically doesn't last too long. So let's just hope Fish is here for the next 10 years. And next thing you know, we've got a perennial top 10 or 15 program. And you know, right. then we're dominating both football and basketball. All right. Everybody out there, we really appreciate you. You are the ones that make the show. Uh, we rely on you for the comments because as many times I'm kind of a schizo at times. I go all over the place. So I rely on you to guys to all corner me in. Ben White does a very good job of this as well. John Brogan, I love having you on, buddy. We should get you on more when you don't have the Rugrats. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> All right. For uh, Ben White, John Brogan, I am merely Mike Luke. As always, thank you a ton for tuning in. We will be back with you tomorrow on the post game. Three games, three days. We were, were built for tough. We're built to last. Just like Jed Fish, it's personal. You've been listening to the AZ Wildcats post game. We all city like the mayor. 